Hello, and welcome to the Crisis Point podcast. I'm Eric Sammons, the editor-in-chief of Crisis Magazine, and today we have a, a great guest, Janet Smith. And Jan Smith is probably well known to most people listening or watching this podcast. But just as a brief introduction, she is the she's recently retired from the Sacred Heart Major Seminary in Detroit, Michigan, where she was a professor of moral theology, I believe. And she's the author of numerous books, including Humana Vitae, A Generation Later, and A Right to Privacy. I think what she's, at least to me, what she's most well known for is her talk, Contraception, Why Not? What year was that? Did you give that talk, Janet? initially it was 93 okay so it's now for all 93. those 93 okay so for all those youngsters out there 1993 is the year i came into the church yeah and for those youngsters out there i don't know if you realize how big a deal this talk was it was like on the level of scott hahn's conversion tape that was out at about this exact same time uh carl keating's catholicism fundamentalism these were like the big things because up until that point Although there were definitely Catholics who were opposed to contraception still, it was like unspoken and you, there was just no discussion of contraception in the Catholic church. And Janet really is the one who brought it back, I think single-handedly with her talk and with her other work to make it again, something where Catholics could outwardly say, yeah, contraception is immoral. Because at the time, I think, I think a lot of Catholics were afraid to say that. We're afraid to publicly say, and here's somebody saying who's, who's actually a professional and like giving all these good reasons and, and backing up. Because I remember listening to it and you know, I guess I'd been Catholic a very short amount of time at, at that point. I mean, I accepted the church's teaching, but this was great because it, it made you no longer embarrassed to be against contraception. So thank you for that, by the way. Well, thank um, you, yeah. And so for the younger people who weren't around at the time, I just wanted to give that little bit of history. Um, so anyway, so what we want to talk about today is, you know, Crisis Magazine, we like to talk about the crisis. We don't really like to talk about it, but we have to talk about the crisis in the church and the culture today. And so I guess I just want to start, Jan, by just asking, what would you say is the primary crisis in the church today? Mm. Well, it's a um, series of interconnected things, but what, my, what got me thinking there was a crisis in the church um, and opened my eyes to a lot of things I hadn't seen before was the, um, the, the when the news came out about McCarrick in 2018. And that was just, I, got, I just got hit over the head by a ton of bricks. Um, I had been trying to defend the church in so many ways, uh, doctrinally and even, I mean, I try to defend the bishops every chance I, I got. Um, and uh, a lot of things they did mystified me. Uh, I thought there always was a very pronounced left wing politics coming out of the USCCB. And I very naively thought, well, there must be a good reason for us. I wish they would tell us what there is. They must have a strategy here that I, I'm i not seeing. 4D and chess. What? 4D chess they're playing, right? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. And I, I, I told people before, but I mean, I uh, when the sex abuse crisis came out in 2002, uh, and that was of children, prepubescent uh, kids, um, I couldn't believe it, that it was so widespread in the church. I could not believe it. I knew that there was a homosexual presence in the church. I had read The Wanderer and The Reporter in the 70s and 80s, and they were reporting it. Both the left and the right in the church were reporting it. And then a series of books came out in the early 2000s that confirmed that in many ways. And I was sure that there were little conclaves of bishops all over the United States meeting to figure out what to do about this. I was sure there was. I said, if I know it, they know it. And they must be doing something about it. And then when the McCarrick scandal was exposed, a lot of things got exposed. And of course, the Vigano letter. And at that time, I, I became a believer in the presence of what's called a lavender mafia in the church. Uh, a church that is, there's a, a high percentage of men and uh, priests and bishops uh, who are active homosexuals and they surround themselves with other hom active homosexuals. They run the diocese and they choose uh, the next appointments for the positions of influence and power. And they choose men that they can influence. Most of them also active homosexuals, some not, just men with weak characters who are ambitious and um, can be manipulated. And I know that sounds very cynical, but 
anybody who knows me would know my whole life I've been a Pollyanna. I still am. I still have to sort of just say, come on, this is the facts. These are, this is the reality. Stop running away from it. Stop trying to make excuses. Stop, stop trying to, this, you found this out. Um, it's been confirmed in so many ways. Uh, anyway, so that's, that's the number one crisis, but that's also a, um, either a cause of or allied with, honestly, a, a loss of real faith, a really profound, zealous faith among the bishops. Um, and that stands to reason. Uh, most people, most men with the same sex attraction who are active don't have a lot of faith. So why would they? And again, we've seen that the, the response of the church during the COVID crisis has just been um, appalling. Uh, it was, the, it's the, been the laity that's been saying, please, please, please give us the sacraments. And when I went to mass this morning, I was talking to the young priest at, um, at a church that I serve, I, I go to now and then. And um, I, I just, I'm just remembering last year at this time, he had started having uh, the Eucharist in a classroom of a, a no longer used school building and put chairs outside. And we would go out in the frigid cold and uh, you know, several hours a day, every day he had it for us and people would come. And I just thought, what, what great sensitivity <laughs> to our needs that we, and that it was so edifying to see Catholics there in, in real cold, you know, with covered up with everything you can uh, to be there with the Lord. And it just demonstrated to us how important he was. And of course, all the priests who were hearing confessions outside and all of those things, well, where were the bishops? I mean, where were they? And I think, I mean, I have relatives who have not been to church for over a year because they still think that somehow it's um, required by the church that you stay away so that you don't spread, spread COVID. And I don't see the bishops telling them that they can go back. I mean, you can be sure if, if COVID were being spread at churches, it would be all over the news because Absolutely. the state does not want us going to church. I go to two churches and I know that people have a lot of objections to this, but they're nearly full and almost no one's wearing a mask. And you can be sure if COVID were be spreading at those masses, they'd be shut down in a millisecond. Absolutely. Yeah. So, or nanosecond, I think is what you mean. <laughs> so that, that's what I think the crisis is. Uh, honestly, an, um, an overwhelming um, presence of the Lavender Mafia and, uh, and all sorts of corruption comes with that. Tons of financial corruption, tons of it. Um, abusiveness, uh, you know, the, the complete um, abusiveness of faithful priests, not allowing them to, to preach the gospel. You get, you get sidelined if you are too ardent and zealous in preaching of, of the faith. A persecution of absolute per sidelining and persecution of faithful priests over and over again. It's almost as if there is a playbook that they have um, on how you deal with these things. And then um, again, the loss of faith, which is more serious than anything. I mean, if we had men with same sex attraction who were devout and leading a chaste life and teaching the church's teaching, that'd be a whole different story, but that's not what we have. Yeah, it just is amazing. I. I was on with uh, Taylor Marshall a while ago, and we were both joking about, not joking, but saying how we both were radicalized by the McCarrick situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was going to, for example, I was going to traditional Latin mass for years before that, but there was something about the McCarrick situation where I just thought, okay, we have to stop playing games because mm -hmm. I feel like we've been playing games. Like we've been yeah. taking it kind of half seriously. Like, you know, obviously 2002, mm -hmm. when the abuse crisis first became public, I think there was some, you know, a lot of us realized, okay, maybe the bishops aren't doing a great job. I know before that I was very much like, you know, the bishops are perfect, do nothing wrong almost. And then I started realizing, okay, maybe they make mistakes. I kind of had your attitude a little bit, which was, okay, there's probably something behind the scenes, but McCarrick blows that away. I mean, there's just no, there's no way you can defend that. But what's, what I think is insane, even more insane is it's now been almost three years and I don't see a, any fundamental difference in anything that the way the bishops do anything from before McCarrick to after McCarrick. I mean, do you see, have oh, you seen yeah, any no, evidence fact, that it's they- It's the same old, same old, same old. They've set up this, um, this website for reporting bishops. And I've been dealing with a victim who last June or July reported several bishops for covering up his abuse. 
last June or July. He has sent this, <clears throat> I've seen it. I've seen his report. I've gone to the website. He's given me his, his login. I've seen the multiple documents that he has, has filed. There's just, this isn't, there's no question that these things happened, all right? And there's no question it's been verified. Um, and he has not, and he's, every couple of weeks, he sends a new email and says, when am I going to hear back from you? He has never heard back from them. And this is this, and so it's, it's just, it's one, every time they do something, it's just gaslighting. It's one more way of making us think they're doing, they say we're doing something, we're doing this big thing. And I mean, there has been some progress, of course, in dealing with um, uh, the sex abuse of minors, but that's largely because the law, it's against the law, it's criminal activity, and they'll go to jail unless they report it. And so now they're reporting it. But that, that it's really indicated a change of heart. I, I hate to say I don't see it. I was asked by a, a, an assistant to a bishop in some European country, uh, I, I'd say it was, but I, I don't know if these things should be traced, <laughs> who um, you know, was asking me, he really, want, he says they haven't yet um, dealt with the phenomena of sex abuse in their, in their episcopacy, but he knows it's coming. And he wants to know who I think here has dealt well with um, pedophile priests. <laughs> Say, no. yeah. When you, I you find one, let me know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the person I contacted, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure Strickland has, and um, I, I contacted one bishop. Um, he's done some really good things. He's only an auxiliary, but he's done really good, good things. So he gave me the name of a couple other bishops. Again, they're very young bishops who he thinks are, are getting it. Because of course they've all been formed by the same culture. Right. And so what they're being told how to do things and they have to be like us. They have to say, I'm not gonna do the way it's been done before. Right. You know, so th they're having to, and they're, you know, they're breaking ranks in a sense. So, but I hope they do, I hope they do. That's, I think we need to desperately pray, um, desperately pray that there will be some bishops and I have to, I have to think they're gonna be up and coming bishops. I mean. This is my little projection. Don't believe anything I say as far as prognosis. I'm almost always wrong. But this is this is my little suspicion that we're going to see before, somewhere in the next five years tons of early retirements of bishops who are feel the, the law snapping at their heels. They um, they're sick and tired of being exposed and the the media Catholic media going after them. Sick and tired of closing schools and churches and fighting everything and they're afraid they're afraid they're afraid that they're going to be exposed they're gonna they're gonna get out of here and i hate to say it go off to their condominiums okay in some exotic place with the fun that they like to have and um the next the next line in line is not much better i mean they were groomed to be the same kind of bishop my hope is they won't take it when they're offered it and say i don't want that headache i thought i was going to get all these great perks but now all I get is the law snapping at my heels and everybody mad at me. I hope there's a third level of men who are good men, good priests. We've had many uh, that we have um, formed in Sacred Heart Major Seminary, all right? I've seen a generation of priests that were formed by John Paul II, that were formed by good professors and formators. They have had, I mean, I don't know how beaten up they've are. I don't know how compromised they are, but I know they believe. And I'm hoping that um, when they're, that they'll be the only ones left that would take the dreadful position of a bishop and they'll take it and they'll make a difference. That's my hope. Hey, yeah, that would be great if they did. I mean, I think the elephant in the room is the man in the Vatican and the Vatican itself <laughs> in that Pope Francis is, does not have a good track record when it comes no. to appointing bishops. I mean, he when he came when he became pope, there was talk of him cleaning up things and stuff like that. But there's no evidence of any cleanup whatsoever. In fact, I'd say it's gotten worse. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if he yeah. put Supich in his in the head right. of a congregation of, of bishops, you got to say this, this is over. It's right. I mean, you know, I mean Supich. I mean, we, we can say many times yeah. it's over. This is just one more. It's over. It's been over for some time. Right. But this is just one more. It's over. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so, I mean, the problem is, is like. And I've said this for a, a while that how we choose bishops, how the church chooses bishops right now, the whole process involved is fundamentally flawed because mm -hmm. it just it continues this cycle, the lavender mafia, whatever you want to call it. But it just even even 
not even going that far, but just saying it, it picks men who do not want to make waves. And if you really want to confront the lavender mafia, you want to confront the abuse and things going on in your diocese, you have to make waves. And lots of people will hate you. But the other problem is if they do that, most of them know they won't get support from the Vatican. They'll get undercut. But, but, but you, what, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. But just a little twist to that is that that's how priest, young men are formed in the seminary from day one. From day one, the young men are told that they need to keep their heads down, all right, be docile, trust us, stay in your lane, don't rock the boat. And if they do anything um, to, especially if they sort of have manifest um, heterosexuality, all right, now that can be balanced by docility, all right? So I'm not saying that the only ones that get through don't have manifest heterosexuality because some of them do. But, but at the same time, in order to, to fulfill their vocation, what do you, I mean, if you were a young man, you know, and you think God has called you to the priesthood and you come into a seminary and before long it becomes clear that you just need to go along, to get along to go along, right? Or whatever, however that phrase goes, but how does it go? Get along oh. to go, go along to get along. Something. Go along to get along. So, yeah. So, I mean, and, and these are good men. And I, I always think some of them have to swallow a lot to be faithful to the vocation that they've been called to. I don't necessarily want them to, you know, stand up out of the, um, and get, get shot down. You know, it, it, a lot of times I would tell me, yeah, I'm sorry to say, keep your head down and just, but try to keep, keep that spark in your being of true masculinity so that when you get in a position where you can make um, true decisions, you don't, um, you do the brave thing, you do the right thing. And, and I had one of the reasons I, I retired, there were several, but one of them, you know, I would, I would get questions from young men. I, what are we gonna do, Professor Smith, um, if, uh, you know, we know something and uh, we think we should tell it, but we think if we do, we're gonna get, get removed from the priesthood and the guy won't get um, disciplined. You know, we think we'll, 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 we'll tell something we've heard or that we know, but it's gonna be taken out on us. And, and I said, all I can say is pray about it. I said, um, all I can say is some of, God's gonna ask some of you to stick up your head and get sidelined. That's gonna be your martyrdom for the Lord. Some of you, God is gonna say, just be a good pastor to your parish. I'll take care of it. And I said, I'm not giving you a formula. I'm saying you have to ask God what he wants you to do and hope that you know how to hear his voice. And it was questions like that, that just, um, it was, I just couldn't, I didn't know, <laughs> you know, sort of, I would say some of the, some of the um, power structure in the seminary didn't like me doing that. And, but I, I didn't, I couldn't let be less than honest. Right. You know, when I would talk to them about a sex, the sex abuse crisis, one time I got a standing ovation from the students because I talked to them in a way that nobody, every, everybody else said, mm, right. you know, keep your head down. I talked to a, a seminarian who left, um, uh, um, what is it, the, the seminary at Seton Hall, which was McCarrick's seminary. And he told me, you could, he said that the air was thick with secrecy. He said, you, you walked out of your room and you're just sort of looking, you know, and he said, we, we couldn't talk about it. He said, we couldn't talk about it. And he said, one day, a couple of he, he, friends, good, strong young men, um, really pushed for a, a, a meeting at the seminary about it. And he said, they gave it 45 minutes. And he said, one of the seminarians stood up and said, um, stood up and said, why is it that other pe why people are so concerned about other people's sexual lives? I, don't, I think there's people are trying to out homosexuals. Why is that anybody's business? And, and he said, none of the faculty, none of the staff said anything. No, no, no one gave a corrective to that. And that is the atmosphere in the seminaries. And, and maybe there's seminaries that aren't that way, but I haven't heard of them. I mean, I know there's good seminaries in the sense that they get good doctrine right. and they get lots of good formation, but it is not the goal of the seminary to form a man who will come out and stand up for the truth in the church itself. They're, they're, that is not a part of their formation. Yeah, and I think that, and we see that, I mean, the laity, it affects us too. We have this improper understanding of the virtue of obedience. 
And yes. you see that being done because there's two sides to it. In fact, I was just teaching an adult conversion class and we were using the Baltimore Catechism. And one of the things it was talking about was the idea of obedience. And it was saying how there's two sides to it. We have a duty to obey our legitimate superiors, uh, our parents or whoever it may be. Uh, when, but then on the other hand, they have a duty to only command those things that they have the authority to command. And we don't have a duty to obey them when they command things that we don't have. They don't have the authority to, to command. And so this whole idea of the not, re, you know, secrecy and not reporting when things are going wrong, not, not to the authorities, whatever. I mean, the bishops are essentially, maybe not in words, but in their actions, they're, they're, they're commanding in obedience that they don't have the authority to command. Well, they do is- it in words. They, they tell them, they, if they come to them with, they, they, I, one of the things that broke up wide open for me was, um, right, I put something on Facebook in 2018, and I had a young priest call me up, and he says, we have that in, in my diocese, and it was him, and he was living with a, um, a priest who had just, uh, his homosexual lover of 30 years, had just died, and he was a very powerful priest in the diocese. And when he reported it, the young priest was told, "Keep your mouth shut, keep your head down." He could ruin your priesthood. Right. Now, how how can that be? And 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 you know, I heard this was a former student of mine. All right, so I trusted him absolutely. In fact, he prevailed. He prevailed finally. But the the oh my gosh, what needed to be done to to have him prevail? was incredible. I mean, there had to be almost a sense of rebellion of, of many of the good priests of the diocese that unless you do something about this, we're gonna, it's just, you know, to the bishop, basically, we, we back him, we know what the story, but the, anyway, so that's, it's very common. And, and then when they sideline a priest and this priest desperately wants to get back into ministry, that's what he's called to do. And the, pre, and the bishop says to him, don't you talk about this to anybody. Don't you tell anybody um, why you've been sidelined or what you reported or anything. And so, I mean, I have, my spiritual director is 92 years old. <laughs> he tells me if we return to the priesthood, all the priests who have been unjustly sidelined, there would be no voc- vocations crisis. We would have enough priests. <laughs> you know, it, that went. And these seminarians and, and young priests particularly, they, we have to realize what a, a, uh, weak position they are in, in the sense of many of them have no skills outside of the, the priesthood. And since they don't have workable, you know, employable skills, they're, they're not married or anything like that, but they don't have any, they, they don't even have a place to live. They don't have any, they probably, you know, they get paid so little, they have no savings to speak of something like that. So the, if you're 30 years old, you've been a priest, let's say a year or two, you find something like this out, you know, there's a real a real possibility, if you say something, you are going to be basically thrown to the curb with no, no support and no, no financial support and no way to make a living because you're 30 years old and you didn't, you, you went to seminary. What, what's a degree in theology and, and philosophy going to do you? Because you're not going to get hired by any church either. Any Catholic parish isn't going to hire you. So the, the point is, is that that's a real, in my opinion, that's a real abuse of them by the bishops because they're in a vulnerable position. And so they are silenced because they, they, we, they're in this we, position. Yeah, I'm sure you've read about our Father Perone here in the, Archdi- the Archdiocese of Detroit, 70 years old, golden, golden man, golden priest, wants to, you know, has no desire to retire. His desire is to be a, a priest. And, and because he, I mean, he was absolutely falsely accused. It's been proven in court. Uh, he, he, this detective did his deposition and absolutely falsified the testimony of the supposed victim who claims he wasn't, all right? He said, she completely distorted my testimony. And um, she has been ordered to pay $125,000 in damage. And now he's, Perone is suing the canon lawyer of the diocese because he believes that he also engaged in, in defamation. Now, the chances of Perone ever being able to be to be an pr- active priest again is just about negligible, right? He's doing this, um, you know, to show people what a, a corrupt, corrupt system it is. Now, Perone was one of the ones who was a witness to Michael Rose, who, who wrote the book, 
in the early 2000s on Goodbye Good Men. He sent in a dossier, which he sent to the papal nuncio. I mean, he, he did all the th steps he should take uh, to reveal the corruption in the seminary and in the priesthood in Detroit. And um, he's had a target on his back ever since. And I don't know why they waited until he was 70 years old uh, to finally, I mean, they gave him, a, you know, a remote parish in an, uh, in a dead part of Detroit, and he has a he had a vibrant parish from people that would drive an hour to go into his his masses, but not because there was a there was any kind of neighborhood. There's no neighborhoods for many of these churches. They give them the churches. We have an Institute of Christ the King here, right. which is that they've had to keep adding masses because they're bursting at the seams, and there's no neighborhood there. All right, so it's it's people who drive 45 minutes an hour to go in and go to mass there, right. and so. You see someone like Perone, and you say, here is a man who's very healthy, 70 years old, all his wits about him, uh, experienced, beautiful priest, and he's sitting over there because he's been falsely accused. We have a priest, and they're telling us there's, they're closing churches because they don't have enough priests. Right. Yeah. It's it, a crime. Crazy. Now, well, I think both of us, just from following you on social media and, and different things you're doing, mm -hmm. I feel like both of us had a similar um response at least personally to some of these crises especially McCarrick in that we both became more traditional mm -hmm. I mean I know myself before McCarrick I was kind of traditional Catholic but I didn't want to call myself that because of the bad stereotypes but afterwards I was like this is stupid I'm gonna I, that's what I am so I don't mind calling myself <laughs> that but I've seen you you're the same way mm -hmm. why do you and I, I know a lot of people this has happened to where they start going to traditional Latin mass after McCarrick which is a, a weird thing if you if you think about it but I know a lot of people did it. And why do you think that is that a lot of Catholic, lay Catholics at least, are going towards tradition more as a as a direct response to McCarrick yeah. and all the stuff going yeah, on? Yeah, lots of reasons. Um, one of them, I mean, you know, I'm very mad at my church, um, but I'm not about to leave the church. I know this is Jesus's church. I know that. And I know that it's been in terrible shape before. Um, it's in terrible shape right now. But uh, the Holy Spirit, Jesus is with his church, right? Going to Latin Mass, which I love beyond all telling, honestly, it's, it's the most incredible balm for my soul that can be imagined. Um, I went to the Mass this weekend where I think they spent 20 minutes singing the, the tractatus. Right, oh, that's um, a long one. That, that, that's yeah, Psalm 90, that. all right? And I'm just sitting there and I'm in this reverie and I look around and everybody else is in this reverie. I mean, it's 20 minutes of silence at mass. No one's fidgety. You can just see that there's just, just this incredible, again, balm to our souls, all right? So in one sense, I've left my church by going to the traditional Latin mass. Uh, not that I'm saying there, there isn't abuse in, uh, in the tradition, in the in the traditional orders, there surely there is. We've seen some of it very sadly uh, in recent months being exposed. But I don't trust the church anymore. So the church wanted me to trust it about the Novus Ordo, and I did because I'm just a, an appallingly trusting person. <laughs> and um, people challenged me, and I went back to see how the Novus Ordo was instituted, how it came to be. I was again appalled, absolutely appalled that this man Bunini wrote the Novus Ordo, broke with the whole tradition, all right? He was a Mason. A Mason wrote the Novus Ordo, all right? And then the traditional Latin mass was suppressed. And you, we weren't allowed to go, we weren't allowed to go <laughs> to the mass of all the ages for decades. Now I, this is part of, I mean, I'm not absolving myself, but um, of guilt in this. I mean, I wouldn't even look at that question. I wouldn't look at the question of the, the goodness of Vatican II because I was fighting for the church's teaching on contraception. So I did not want to, to go there to be this retrograde pre-Vatican II Catholic. I wanted to be a, a post-Vatican, I'm a Vatican II Catholic all the way. I accept the documents, I accept the Novus Ordo. And then McCarrick comes along. <laughs> breaks put on and the most astonishing and i mean god i didn't make it I, in a way i didn't make a decision it, it, god seduced me i mean it, there was a period of time over several months where i kept going i was i was it was the natural thing to go to the latin mass from where i was or what was happening and all of a sudden i'm saying oh my gosh 
this is this is what I want for the rest of my life. This is where I want to be. It wasn't like I was looking around for something. It wasn't like I was a profound, but I have to say it has been, even though I live in a place right now where I would say the Novus Ordo is said as reverently as it can be said. Um, though there's a lot of music that I absolutely, it's torture for me to um, be in the presence of some of that music. I mean, people say you're, you're overly dramatic. And I say, no, I'll tell you, that's been true my whole adult life as I have found the music in the liturgy to be um, a penance and an extreme penance. I went to mass last week. Um, the music was an extreme penance, even though it's well done. I mean, the, the musician's not a bad musician, but the selection, oh my gosh. And um, anyway, so, and then I started calling friends. I was talking to friends just casually, you know, I, the, you know, I just went, I'm going back to the Catholic mass. And he said, oh yeah, I've been going for six months. I'd say like, what? These are all friends of mine. I had no idea. And one of them you never would have expected to, sort of a granola Catholic for, the, for her whole life. And she went to a retreat in a city where across the street was the church that she was using for meditation. And they did the traditional Latin mass. And so she started going to, it, and she said, we're going back. She said, it just, it just struck me as this is, if you want to be a prayerful, reverent Catholic, this traditional Latin mass does it. I, so yeah, I, that's how it happened to me. I have a priest friend. He's a pastor of a parish and he was, the, the, their main mass on Sunday was a Novus Ordo. They had a low mass, but they had, the, the main was a no, Lat, uh, Novus Ordo, Ordo in Latin, very reverent. It was great. But after McCarrick, he basically, he, he, change it to the tr uh, traditional Latin mass, a sung mass uh, with, you know, he brought everybody on board in the parish, made sure everybody knew what was going on. It took a, a year before he actually did it to get people prepared. He did training sessions. He did everything the right way. But I asked him like, why did you, why did you end up switching to it? And he basically said the McCarrick scandal made him realize we need to bring out the spiritual big guns. Big it's, guns. Exactly. It's like, you know, we are playing, we were playing a game before. Mm -hmm. Now it's like, no, this is, I don't know how you can say this to anything other than demonic, what's going on with McCarrick and with the, the bishops and stuff. And so it's like, we can't play around. We have to bring out the, the biggest guns we have in the traditional Latin mass. I think a lot of us are seeing is literally the biggest gun we have. It's the biggest we gun we have. It. We need to bring it out. Yeah, no, it, it, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, uh, you know, I mean, my friends, a lot of them are academics and a lot of them are just regular people. And I would say most of us think that we've been good Catholics. You know, we'd, we'd say we're probably 80% of our life is full throttle Catholic. And then we realize that 20%, oh, I'm going to get, the, I'm going to, I'm going to do my best to get up to hundred. I'm not being happy with 80% anymore. And everybody I know is doubling down uh, more scriptural study, more adoration, more rosaries, more spiritual reading. Um, the, the hunger is just unbelievable. And what surprised me, I mean, a, a little bit to my credit, I mean, for decades, obviously the mass wasn't available. So I didn't have a choice. I mean, I could have done SSPX, but I didn't even know where that was. I don't even know if it was where I was. Um, and so, uh, so now it's available. It's, it's available in my own parish, which I never on the face of, not that it's a good parish. It's always been a good parish. It's a faithful parish, but that they bring in a Latin, traditional Latin mass, unbelievable. Um, the, the pastor uh, there, he brought an assistant pastor who's very experienced at the traditional Latin mass and he's been doing it, but the pastor wants to do it. And he didn't feel that he, he really wants to know all the Latin. He doesn't just want to say the words. So I've been teaching him Latin for the last couple of months. And yesterday was his first, it was a private, but his first traditional Latin mass. That's awesome. And I went and, and I mean, it was tears. It was oh, tears yeah. of joy. And I could tell he understood every word. He, he said every word with the right phrasing, nothing was rushed through. I, I keep teasing people. I said, oh, I want to tell you, it's going to be a three-hour mass when, when he starts saying it, but you'll like it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but I, but the fact that you, that we have it now, and as you know, I mean, you're a young man for my terms, and I go to mass, and I see, I, you know, I'm, I'm one of the oldest ones there, and I'm not there out of nostalgia. I did grow up with it, but it was not a good experience. It was rushed through. The priest obviously didn't know what he was doing. We had Sunday masses that were 19 minutes, all right? Um, I remember, uh, I remember there was that short period of time in 1965, 66, where 
there was just the translation of the Latin mass. It wasn't the Novus Ordo, it was just the English translation. And then a lot of it was still in the Latin. You would still do the, the Credo and the Gloria uh, in Latin, Agnus Dei Sanctus, and it was beautiful. And then all of a sudden it was the Novus Ordo. And um, I didn't know what to make of it, um, just accepted it. Uh, but seeing these young people there, and um, the mass I go to, again, you, there's some what you call them rad trads, those who all these years have found some way to get to the, to the Latin mass. But most of these people, they're new to it. It's not a part of their background. And I see some kids totally, in, you know, I'm at Ann Arbor, college students, totally inappropriately dressed, you know, cargo shorts and t-shirts. And, and I'm so happy they're there. I, that's not generally my view about people that are poorly dressed at mass, but I'm, I'm sure that before long, they're going to be putting on nice slacks and nice shirts and maybe even a, a sports jacket or something. But they're there, you know, and there's there's this a welcoming. It, you know, a lot of people talk about the traditional people being very judgmental and um, mean spirited. And I don't doubt that people have had that experience. I don't doubt that. But I am sure that that can't last for long because so many of the people there are new. So they're not, they, they aren't, they haven't, and of course that attitude to some extent is justified. I mean, they, they have been beleaguered their whole worshiping life. Um, and for them to be super protective of it, super enthusiastic about it is understandable, but not to be welcoming is a big mistake. And I think um, the, young, the young people are taking over. It's not my mass, it's theirs. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, because there are so many young families that have come in our parish uh, in the past year, it's just grown exponentially. And it's almost all of these young families who were going to, they were faithfully going to their Novus Ordo parish. And for whatever reasons, they, they no longer, they, they started coming to ours. And it's great because I just love seeing them because like, you, you, they don't know what the heck's going on, but they're just <laughs> like, I want to learn. And they kind of, a lot of them, they, 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 they'll, they'll meet me and they'll, they'll talk to me and they're like, okay, what do I do? like at mass, you know, they, they want instructions. And so I send them stuff and, and I'm real excited. We mentioned this before we, we got on air, but I was real excited that um, Sophia Institute is publishing this Benedictus, which is the equivalent of the Magnificat. A lot of, most Catholics know what the Magnificat is. That's that little monthly uh, booklet you bring to mass and you go through, it's a note for the Novus Ordo. Well, this is gonna be the equivalent, but for the traditional Latin mass. And it's perfect for all these new people. Um, it's just a great, because that's the number one question I always get is the missile. Like, I have no idea what to do. I get this missile. I don't know what to do. Right. I'm flipping around right. these young mothers too. God bless them. They got, you know, one kid in their arm, pulling their veil off. They're trying to flip through the missile and it's like, they have no idea what's going on. But I mean, it's just, it's so awesome to see. Uh, Cause like you said, over time, they get used to it. It just becomes a great it, thing. It, I, I hope that that Benedictus will give them an opportunity to Find, I know it's almost impossible to find any quiet time for a young mother, but if, if she had any time uh, just to go through it before they show up at mass right. and, and um, just assume they're not gonna be able to follow anything at mass, but they, that they can sort of key into what's going on because they've read it um, the week before. <laughs> I've been, I told someone the other day, uh, I've gone, I go to the traditional last mass several different places. Um, and there, there's, as you said, lots of young people, lots of little kids. So there's lots of crying. There's lots of fussing kids. And the priests are very good about it. I mean, they say all the right things, you know, even some things I never thought of. One priest said, well, when I hear the crying, he said, I just realized that's the cry of the human heart. And he said, we're just crying out to the Lord. And it's the same thing. Well, you know, I realized I wasn't noticing it at all. Wow. Um, I was so focused on just, it's like being in the zone. I mean, the, almost the minute I get to church, and I used to get there at the last minute and leave at the first minute. Now I try to get there. I'm, I'm not always successful, but my goal is to get there a good 10 or 15 minutes early. And then I like to stay a good five to 15 minutes after mass. I don't want to leave, honestly. I well, This last Sunday, I just thought I could, and it's, I've thought it several times, I could stay here all day because it's put me in such a place of just, um, profound serenity um, and love and trust in the Lord. Um, so I, I get in this zone. And so even though there's all this, this activity and crying kids and uh, everything, I, I don't even notice it, you know? And it's just, and again, the chant just seems to just go cut right through that, right. you know? And, and uh, 
anyway, and I think the kids are quieter when the, when there's chant. Um, they, they it, it it calms all of us, uh, even the kids. But I'm just always so um, amazed that anybody who has a bunch of kids can get them dressed and get them to mass. Um, <laughs> It's and I'm grateful for that. I mean, just it's like an awesome thing. They they come in wearing badges to me. It's like it's like the the general who has all the stripes. You know, these, <laughs> these parents that are bringing all these kids. I mean, those are your stripes. I mean, you That's got right. that one up. You got him dressed. Well, he's mostly dressed. You know, yeah. it's just yeah. It's I've had, yeah, I've had kids. We should, we're getting them out of the van at mass and realize they don't have their shoe. They don't have shoes. They didn't, or like, how did heck what happened? They don't have their jackets freezing out or whatever. But you just yeah. bring them and <laughs> God takes care. And of then it. you'll find those shoes behind a curtain in some back right. room right you know <laughs> two months later sometimes but that's right <laughs> with the dried up pretzels and yeah. <laughs> who knows what else so other than so in response to the crisis other than obviously you know we're, we're talking about going the traditional Latin mass uh really embracing the more traditional aspects of the faith what can the laity do right now? I know there's some things going on. Our mutual friend, Jason Negri, uh, has done some stuff up there. I know. What are some things the laity can do now to confront particularly the, the continued, I call it the abuse crisis, but it goes, it's like you said, it's a faith crisis among the bishops because we're a hierarchical church. The bishops are in charge, whether by divine mandate, we can't change that. We shouldn't want to change that. Yet, what, so what, what can we do? There's no, not, and a lot of, there's lots of things we can't do. As I've also said, it's, it's only the bishops can fix the bishops and they're the problem. They, they're the only ones that can solve the problem and they are the problem. So there's not a lot we can do. I mean, we can support crisis and um, church militant and all these groups who are exposing all of it. We can um, definitely, uh, but the first thing we have to do is protect our own faith is not to let it get us down. And if we start finding that we're neglecting our faith or getting very despondent or whatever, stop paying any attention to any of the reporting about the scandal, just stop and double down in your prayer. Any time that you would have spent reading this or watching that, don't. Anything that chips away at your faith, don't. There's others of us who are in the battle. And God's giving us the grace to not lose our faith. Uh, he may return you to the battle at some point, but right now, protect your faith. Um, again, we all have to be, the, one of the great things is, I think it's made us all bolder about talking about our faith. Um, people want to know, and it's a good opportunity. People say, are, how can you still be a Catholic given what's happened? Now's the time because I love Jesus and I love the sacraments and there's nowhere else I'm going to get this than in the Catholic church. And yes, I'm appalled. I'm this support the good priests, tell them you love them, tell them how grateful you are for what they're, they're doing for the parish. Um, be careful how you give your money. Hmm. You know, you, we used to, you know, you're, be careful about how you give your money. Uh, you know, I'm trying to support my parish, but I'm at this point, I'm not given to the appeal because there's things that are still going on that I think have to be changed. Now, some of the organizations that the appeal supported, I'm more directly giving right. um, money to instead of it coming through the, the appeal, you, you know, money talks. But um, again, I don't think the bishops care that much about money, honestly. You may think they do, but... Um, I'm not certain they're willing to have all these places closed or if they did a few things, they could bump them up and uh, they'd be open. I mean, a lot of parishes, the laity have said that they can keep them open, they can do this and the bishops go ahead and close them anyway. And then you have all these sideline priests. If they were really interested in having vibrant parishes, they'd let Father Perone continue, all right? What are, they, what are they interested in and what do they care about? If they don't care the about same, money, they don't what, care about what corrupt people care about. Just power? Their own pleasure. Yeah, their own pleasure. Their own pleasure, and and that they still have. They have their secretary. They have their beautiful chanceries. They have their beautiful um, living places. They have vacations. They have rich people that wine and dine them and take them to the nicest places. Uh, they lead a pretty posh life, and that's not going to go away. You close the school, their posh life is still there. Right. Um, it's not going to go away. So I want to say there, and they are surrounded by sycophants. And a lot of the sycophants yeah. are laity. And the, the rich people who support the, the bishops have to stop doing it. The one that the bishop can call up and say, I need $10,000 for this. They have to say, 
not until Father Perone's back in ministry. Right. Not until this. All right. And and it, it a lot of it has to do with very wealthy Catholics. They have to get uh, really what we call red pilled, and just close those wallets and close those pocketbooks. And I think there's a certain aspect of you just never say no to the bishop. If, if in, that was mine. Yeah, I mean that was mine. I, if he asked for if he asked for ten thousand dollars and you're rich, it's like okay, you know, your excellency, whatever you need, I'm I'm just going to trust that you're going to use it well, and you just yeah. can't do that. That that was absolutely my attitude. That whatever bishop, if it's in in any realm, like if I had you know thirty speaking engagements and I that was already ten too many, and a bishop asked me to do something, I I, I squeeze it in no matter what. Because it was a bishop who asked me, you know, I'd, I'd honestly still do that, though I don't think many of them are going to be asking me to do anything. <laughs> but um, uh, but it was it was a sense that yes, I am I I'm a I just want to be an instrument of the church, and whatever the bishop wants me to do, I want to do it. Uh, and I think that's a healthy attitude for a Catholic for the most part. But no longer, right. no longer, it absolutely is not. And if you have, a, if you're in a diocese where you think your bishop has sidelined good priests and covered up sexual abuse, you don't don't open your pocketbook to him. Right. Do not do it. Yeah, and then of course the problem is that you want to give to your parish. Let's say you have a great pastor and parish you want to support mm -hmm. him, mm -hmm. but you know when you give to the parish, in most dioceses, a portion of that goes to the diocese. I'm gonna, I just, I just, I just write that off as a penance in a certain sense. I mean, right. some people are very clever. They're giving money. They want to pay the utility bill or they just want to right. do this. And if you've got a way of doing that and, and you're, you're ready, you can go to that trouble and it, pull it off fine. But I, I think it's, if you just want to keep giving like you were giving to the parish, but when some special appeal comes along, you write on the envelope, not until Father Perone is released. Right. You know, it'd say, I want to give. I usually give X amount, but not until Father Perone is released. Yeah, our, our archdiocese, diocesan appeal each year, I just write a note on the card saying, yep. you know, until our Archbishop confronts the, the crisis in the church, and I might say a little bit, and, and I just, and I never get a response. The next year, I, they always say, thank you for your donation from last year. I'm like, I, I didn't give you. So somehow I get marked as donating and I'm oh. on the card complaining. So it's like, I don't Keep know why. Grace. <laughs> yeah. I mean, our, our archdiocese did something on Giving Tuesday, which is a Tuesday after uh, Thanksgiving where they said, you could, if you donate through a certain website to your parish, it will go 100% to parish and nothing will go to the diocese. And I know tons of people who flooded the parish with donations on, I mean, they basically gave their yearly donation, they, everything, they just gave it that one day. Cause that way they knew, okay, we've got- uh, there, There's there are certain ways. I think it's um, the St. Joseph um, Foundation run by Philip Gray who has a plan that that uh, uh, the laity can put together some sort of foundation and then they can um, collect the money and then they pay for whatever the church. I mean, I don't know if, if diocese yeah, take from say building funds or like our church has just recently been beautifully renovated. If we were to give for the renovation, does the diocese take some of that money? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it probably depends but, on the diocese. Every diocese is a little different how they operate. Yes. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I think one of the things we should all prepare for, honestly, is that there's going to be so many church closing, closings and bankruptcy. I, I, I'm, gonna, I've been trying to, I'm just in some crafty way, been trying to suggest this to my friends. And one of these days, I'm going to make a bolder statement. I, I want us to put together a little corporation or something and be ready to buy up a church when these beautiful churches around here, when one of them gets closed and it's up for sale, I want to buy it. Um, and then, you know, we might have to go underground, not just because of the church, but obviously because of the culture. And uh, it may come a time, and it's not unreasonable. Like, there's no certainty about any of this, but it's not unreasonable that there's a huge religious persecution coming. It's already here in real, in real um, tangible kind of ways. But when they say you can no longer worship, Right, I'm going to have this church, and the and the the, the nave is going to be, you know, probably a banquet hall. It's innocent enough, but then there's going to be the the sacristy, the sanctuary is going to be a hidden spot, right, where we can still go to mass. And we, I'm going to find one of these priests that's been sidelined, and he's going to be our priest, and we're going to have 
So I, we got to start thinking that way, I think. The, the, the crazy thing is five years ago, definitely 10 years ago, that sounds like crazy talk. Crazy talk. Yeah. It does. But I don't think it sounds like crazy talk at all right now. I mean, no. I think the COVID thing, which we didn't really talk about, but the whole COVID response just showed that when the state comes, the bishop's going to get out of the way and say, go ahead and take them. I mean, right. they're not going to stand up for us. Not one of them has really stood up. A few of them had said a few good things, but none of them has stood up to the state. because you Make said, a spiritual yeah. communion. Right. I mean, they're basically encouraged people not to go to mass. So, so yeah, I think it's, I don't think it is crazy talk anymore. Although I, I know some Catholics might think it is, but I think the next 10 years, I think things will be radically different 10 years from now than they are even today. They're, um, they're, they're obviously radically different now than they were a year ago. Because I said, I have relatives who haven't been to mass for a year. All right. And these are believing Catholics, but they think that this is what their bishops want of them is not to go to mass. And if they go to mass, they ignore the grocery store. But if they go to mass, they're going to get COVID or transmit COVID, but not at the grocery store. Yeah, it's just insane. It's insane. Yeah. Well, before we conclude, I wanted to ask, so you're retired now. So what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> I recommend it. All I have to say is I recommend it. Um, I'm pretty much as busy as I ever was. Um, miss my students. <clears throat> um, miss some parts of teaching, but I was getting kind of, I just kind of get worn out. I had said that, you know, in class, I kept saying, have I said this before? Have I said this before? And I'm thinking, I don't want to be saying, have I said this before all like right. 20 times during one class period? Cause I, I've taught it so many times. And um, I just felt there's going to be people that have more enthusiasm for this than I do um, right now. And then again, the sex abuse crisis kind of drove me over uh, the wall or something because I, I just um, was troubled with what I saw in front of me. And, you know, maybe you could say I should have stayed to keep pushing it, but I, I, I didn't want to be at odds with the seminary. Maybe that's wrong, but I, it seemed that God wanted me to do other things. And so the things I'm doing is I spent an enormous amount of my time um, dealing with victims, with whistleblowers, with sideline priests, writing for different things, um, and uh, uh, learning, 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 reading. I mean, the, the, I have shelves of books now about the sex abuse crisis, about the, the Latin mass, about Vatican II, um, things that I, I really didn't uh, educate myself about while I was um, busy teaching and speaking. And then the speaking course is basically dried up. Uh, except for a few Zoom things, which are nice. You don't have to pack and go somewhere. <laughs> Though I miss all the people. You really do miss the interaction. Um, so and I, I, I hope to do some more writing. There's a couple of books I'd like to get written on along the way. I took care of my mother for full-time for about a year and a half, part-time for about four years who had dementia. And it was really a, a transformative, a great grace. And she was hilarious. And I would put her our conversations on Facebook, and they were very consoling to people um, that you could have this kind of a reality in the midst of dementia. And so uh, I want to write on that. I, I'm uh, trying to defend the proposition that some falsehoods are morally permissible. And um, I want to write something, maybe a couple, art. I've written some on it, but I've had some um, uh, counter arguments, and I'd like to respond to those counter arguments. I'm doing a a debate on it in a couple, I think March 9th with Matt Frad, not with him, but he's hosting it with a father, Gregory Pine, who I okay. don't he's a young man, he's a Dominican. Okay. And so we're going to debate the issue. I got I, a couple I, other things. I going. don't remember who you wrote it for, but you wrote a great piece on that issue. I'm in the same position. First thing is called. Okay, um, first things, yeah. It's either, I think it's fig leaves and falsehoods or falsehoods and fig leaves, one right. or the other. And it was just great. And I, I the Thank funny you. thing is, I was literally, we were going through the commandments last night at the adult conversion class that I'm teaching at our parish. And somebody brought up, well, if it's okay in some instances to actually take somebody's life because of this or that, why is it never okay to tell an untruth to somebody? And I was like, that's a great question. And I, I basically said, it's a huge debate in the church. I gave both sides and I told them what I thought, but I, I gave both sides of the, of the debate. So I'm going to tell him about your uh, debate coming up because he'll be interested in watching. Yeah. That. Yeah. It's going to be, it's going to be fun. Yeah. I mean, it is really at a certain point. I mean, when I first started arguing it, I was much more tentative now is, as it often happens, you just become 
we're more certain that you're right. <laughs> and so, I, I, and my point really is that if I'm wrong, I want to be proven wrong. Right. Um, and if I'm not even arguing good arguments, but I'm arguing a true conclusion, I want people to provide better arguments. Right. But I, I, it's much like the notion of obedience. I, I think that, I think you were onto something about a false understanding of obedience. There's a wonderful essay online by uh, John Lamont, L-A-M-O-N-T. And he talks about two different notions of obedience. One was Thomas Aquinas and one was Ignatius. And oddly enough, Ignatius had a more, a stricter understanding of obedience than Aquinas. Aquinas saw obedience for the most part. I mean, obviously there's times when you have to, even as an adult, but it was, it's more of a transitional virtue. It's a virtue that put you in a place to help you become more prudential because you've submitted yourself to someone else's um, judgment. And certainly you don't obey unreasonable um, commands, uh, harmful ones. I mean, you might, if it's small enough, you know, clean the bathroom for the 50th time, okay, or maybe that's unreasonable the, the fifth time. But, um, but that Ignatius had this notion that, again, if you needed to obey almost entirely short of serious sin. Um, and that what, if there's any wrong being done, it's on, a, on the soul of the superior who's making the demand, right? And you wanna say, wow, that puts people in a very bad spot, right. you know, that I don't have to worry. I don't have to make this, you know, he, the, the bishop tells me to be quiet about this abuse well, it, that's on his soul and not mine. Right. And you want to say, that's a nice little dodge right. um, about the whole thing. And then, of course, it allows the superior to abuse it. He knows that you will obey whatever you tell him, whether it's absolutely criminal uh, or not, and that you're going to feel okay about it because you've obeyed your superior. And so I it's feel a real Catholics problem. And Catholics today the Ignatian view is dominant of, of yes, obedience. Yes. You find that all the, the entire onus is on the person, the, the, the inferior to, to obey. And that, that's everything. And there's no discussion of what about what's on the superior, but also just this idea that there are times, I mean, Aquinas, I, I wrote an article actually for Crisis before I was the editor about this in relationship to, to COVID and the idea that mm -hmm. Aquinas himself, you know, he talks about that there's only, only God do we give complete and unconditional obedience to. There is no human being that we give, even a religious to a superior who makes a vow of obedience still does not give complete and unconditional obedience to a superior. And there's, and it's not just simply if it's, they, they, they ask you to sin. That's not the only reason you would disobey an order from a superior. It, it, it's broader than that. And it's like, and a lot of it has to do with whether or not they have the authority to command it. And I made, right. the, I made the example one time, like if my neighbor comes to me and says, I, you have to wear an orange shirt tomorrow. I mean, it's like, okay, I could wear it just to be neighborly, but he has no authority. I don't have, I'm not committing any sin or any problem. Just saying right, no, right. he has no authority to. And if I, in fact, if I found out then later, it was because he was supporting, that was like some cause that was anti-Catholic, whatever. I obviously I wouldn't have to then, but it doesn't even have to be that. I just don't have to obey him because he doesn't have authority. And so with a, obviously with COVID, we Wait, saw What this. do you think about the authority of a bishop telling us that we need to wear masks at mass? Oh, you're just going to get me in trouble. Um, <laughs> I, I think, I don't think he has that authority because I think the bishop's authority is based upon, it has a certain, um, uh, it comes through the church and canon law. I mean, only the Pope can really defy canon law, um, even though he shouldn't, but only he has the authority. A bishop has to abide by canon law, and canon law states very clearly that pastors cannot withhold the sacraments from people unless there's a real clear reason, like they're, like uh, um, somebody who's a uh, gray scandal or something like that. And so somebody wearing a mask does not meet that. I don't see how that reasonably meets this, this level of, of you can deny the sacraments. Because that's what they're saying. They're saying you have to, if they're saying you have to wear a mask to mass, what they're saying is we will deny you Holy Communion if you don't have this piece of cloth on your face. And I just don't think they have the authority to say it because, yeah. and, and so I just would say, no, they, they, they can't do it. Now, 
somebody wears a mask, the mask is not, they're not doing anything wrong either, but I'm just saying, I don't think that they have yeah. that authority to. I, to I, um, I had a communication with our, our, our priest because again, the Latin mass people are very disinclined to, most of them disinclined to wear masks. And he makes this uh, a very ambiguous appeal. He, he, he tells us that he really doesn't think the studies show that it makes a difference. Right. Um, he understands a lot of people think it's uh, an attempt at tyrannical co control. But he asks us to do it out of charity for the other people who are there who might think it's important that masks be worn. And, and um, nobody, almost nobody puts on a mask, even though he makes this ardent mixed appeal, mixed appeal, which is good because he's honest. I mean, he's not, you know, he's telling us what he thinks. So I wrote him a note. I said, you know, you have to understand your audience more. I, I put a mask on immediately when he said that but not out of charity. <laughs> I said, don't ask this group to do it out of charity. Not that they're not charitable people, but they don't think it's charitable to cooperate with tyranny. They don't think it's uh, charitable to wear a mask when it's not doing any good and might do harm. I said, the reason I put it on because I was just rude to this woman outside who was selling a newspaper. And she, she ticked me off for some reason. And I, I, I felt bad about that. And I said, I need to do penance. Right. So my penance is I'm going to wear this blankety blank mask. All right. And, and, and I said, you, the way you can, appear, if you really want these people to wear a mask, tell them to do it out of penance because that then they'll do it. And he has, he said, well, that's a great idea. I'm going to try it. He hasn't <laughs> tried it yet, but it, it, I've decided that's what will get me to wear one because I'm a wretched human being who needs more penance. And, um, and I, I, I mean, I don't like people looking at me and saying she's cooperating with tyranny or she's buying all this, she's accepting all this bad science. I don't like that. And, and I, of course, I'm glad that people think I'm charitable. But what I'd rather have them think is that I'm a wretched human being who needs penance. And that's why I'm, I'm doing but them it. them thinking those things about you, negative things about you, that's part of the penance as well. So it's a humiliation of it. So, but yeah, yes, that's right. It's part, of, it's part of the penance that I have to except people saying, I, I thought she was, I thought she was more courageous than that. Right, right, saying, yeah. no, when you see me doing this, know that it's just a, it's a I, I, that's what I could, should get embroidered across the front of it. I'm doing this because I'm a sinner. Yeah, right. Yes. That would be a great idea. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh yeah, I could talk for the next hour about how much I hate masks, but I won't. Yes. Um, so anyway, but I think we're gonna uh, wrap it up here. What, how can people who want to find out about the work you're doing now, and, and now that you're retired, uh, what what can we uh, I have where can a website find you? I have a website that is imperfect but it things eventually get up there they can always google my name they'll find anything but janetsmith.org I try to post anything that I've written up, up there or talks that I've given if they've been recorded links to it that sort of thing it's imperfect but usually if you just type in my name put sex abuse crisis or something like that latin mass what I am trying to do is I'm trying to teach people how to follow the latin mass who don't know Latin. It's oh. a it's a work in progress. So um, I've got a primitive version of it on the website for some of the prayers. I've I'm fine tuning my method, and I think before long I'll have a penultimate version that I put up there, and then the feedback I get will help me perfect it even further. That's great. So JanSmith.org. Uh, and I'm very uh, proud to announce that Jan has uh, started writing for Crisis again after a 30-year absence. I, I look back at the archives. You, you wrote for Crisis back in like 1990, maybe 89. And so I'm very excited. She's already written. I had, submit, I had submitted something that was really good and it got turned down. Well, that and was so, before my reign. So no, I, long, long before your reign. And it, it doesn't reflect well on me that I didn't go back. But um, Crisis did uh, publish a couple things two years ago right after the crisis hit um, that uh, two of my former students wrote that couldn't get it anywhere and I sent it to crisis and asked if they post those things and they did and they were very important articles mm -hmm. so um, my absence uh, probably reflects badly on me Oh, no, more not, than on a crisis. So. Well, we're very glad to have you back. So, and yes. of course, Crisis Magazine is at crisismagazine.com. So I want to thank Jan Smith very much for uh, talking with us today about the crisis and what's going on and all the work you're doing. And I mean, you've been, yeah, you're, you're, you've been doing great work for a very long time. So we well, thank all you. appreciate that. So God bless you. And thank you very much, everybody. See you next time.